watching this right now you're listening just leave a comment leave a comment let us know what you think uh, what you think the most egregious offense is here as far as people who are in charge and really the information war against the american middle class and working class right now and i, I want to be very careful about that when i say working i mean working class yeah i want to be very clear in that what i am talking about is different from bernie sanders or or the yang chang gang um business owners are the working class as well Small business owners, yeah. mid-sized business owners, business owners that are running businesses that are multi tens of millions of dollars. Welcome, welcome everybody uh, to this week's episode of Left Reckoning. Um, we got some high-level ideas tonight, uh, just like that first one off the top. Uh, soon we're going to be joined by uh, Edward Angueso to talk about Section 230 and you. Uh, Kenzo Shibata, uh, who's a teacher in Chicago and, a, uh, and the host of a really great podcast called Class Time, uh, will be joining us later to be talking about the teacher struggle in Chicago for fair and humane treatment. Uh, later in the show, a discovery that will rattle any libertarian Housing homeless people works much better than leaving folks out in the cold. And Joe Biden, where are our checks? Uh, part five, six, seven, eight, and nine at this point. We're working on. We got to see what Susan Collins. We got to <laughs> ask her opinion for some reason. So. <laughs> yeah, man. How are you doing, Matt? Should be a good one. Uh, I'm doing good. Uh, good to see you, David. People might know our, we're a little bit higher tech now um, as we are before. So I'm enjoying that but uh, i'm you know all things considered with uh having to for some reason have this bipartisan uh per like discussion of where susan collins decides that uh people who made like sixty five thousand dollars are too high income <laughs> to yeah. deserve uh two thousand dollars it's pretty gross um but you know what can you do um, yeah man i mean <laughs> That's the that's the real thing, and, and we'll get into this opening opening bit in a second. But it's really hard uh, to get down with the Biden administration. I mean, like to really do good analysis uh, regarding them, sort of like it was with Trump too, because it's like they're just so bad, and they're going to do you know whatever the most wicked thing that they can get away with, and will benefit their their base as possible right uh so we're trying as much as possible on this show to certainly cover it uh we're not going to ignore what's going on out there in the theater but to make sure that we're sort of not getting lost in the in the back and forth because uh, you really can and there's plenty of people doing that and at, at a certain point you know there is and it's great that plenty of people are doing it but that's not the goal of what we're trying to do here 
Yeah, it's like it's so and I kind of touched on this. Patreons will have heard a conversation I had with Ron Reagan. Like people want to rush to put things in a win and loss column when it comes to this. And until there's actual material policy changes uh <laughs> that are impacting, you know, the bureaucracy and whatever whatever it is, right? Um, then it's all posturing and politics. Uh, so th- it's important to just stress what is still left on the table. And mm-hmm. with regards to this, like negotiating things down, there's no reason to do so. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, Joe Manchin and Susan Collins, like I, why are you bringing Susan Collins to this party? She doesn't belong here. No. Um, so a hundred percent. And you know, um, yeah. So let, let's start with this, though, because Matt and I have been spending the past couple of weeks really trying to study the work of, of Leo Panich and Sam Ginnon. Um, I did a stream on Tuesday, and I'm going to be trying to do a lot more of those, sort of going through more in depth these ideas. But I want to build on one in particular today, just sort of set us on on the uh, on the path for tonight's episode. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about how important it was to move from protest to politics and how that move on the left has made a huge difference in our capacity and our possibility and also our momentum in general, right? For decades and decades and decades, the left was focused so much uh, almost exclusively on the protest aspect, which is important, but at a certain point, you need to start building and fighting uh, to win power. Um, And so the move from protest to politics is something that is really important, but then I also wanted to make sure uh, that we're understanding another really critical distinction, which is the the difference between class-focused politics and class-rooted politics, right? Um, And this is not necessarily a criticism. One is better than the other, but it's not criticizing or misunderstanding um, how important a class-focused politics can be. So for example, with the Bernie Sanders movement, what we're a part of right now is very much a class-focused movement. And that's a good thing. You need to be class-focused and class-oriented to build the kind of movement that we need in the long run. but eventually those movements have to become class rooted, especially if they want to follow through on their goals and to avoid the pitfalls which come from social democracy. And to compare those two ideas, you have to look at what happened with Syriza and Moss. So Syriza was a political movement, political party in Greece right, that united a bunch of different socialist and left organizations and comes into power in Greece and had tremendous success. It was the darling of the radical socialist left for a period of time. This is before Bernie Sanders, so some of y'all might have not been around for this chapter, right? But this was the darling of the socialist left. They come into power trying to fight the austerity of the European Union, which was essentially uh, strangling the entire economy of Greece. And they come through with a radical, uh, a radical uh, mandate uh, to, you know, to fundamentally challenge austerity. But what ends up happening is eventually uh, Cyprus, um, the leader of Syriza, ends up having to accept another austerity package um, from the European Union, right? Despite having mass mobilizations in the streets and people all protesting and yelling the slogan oxy, which means no, saying we are going to put this to a referendum and the people say no to this. But still the government of Syriza capitulated uh, to the demands of the European Union, right? And a lot of leftists, uh, you know, will argue that this is exactly why you can't do electoralism. Um, But that's not really uh, the best way to look at what happened with Syriza. What happened with Syriza wasn't that there weren't enough radicals in the party, but that the party had lost its cadres and connection to the base. A good example of this was the education minister of Syriza wanted to try um, to use schools around the country as radical meeting places for workers to come together and start to build workers' councils, right? That's a radical socialist idea. That's not a reformist idea. That's a radical idea. But what ended up happening was, okay, the minister says they want to do this, but then they had lost that connection uh, to the people to be able to start to implement that, right? So you have an idea that's good, and then you lose the ability to do the how, right? Um, and that's what happens when you break um, from you know your cadres, and that's essentially what happened in Syriza. And I go through this a lot deeper on on my talk I did on Tuesday, so definitely check that out if you're interested. But I wanted to compare that to what happens with the with Moss, with Evo Morales in Bolivia, right, where you see this horrible U.S. back coup against Evo Morales um, that has now um, you know been the 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 coup forces have been beaten. 
we are now in a situation where Moss is back in power, despite all the, the lobbying from the U.S. government and the powers of capital. Um, but how did that happen? Look, under Moss um, and under Evo's leadership, it wasn't perfect. They were doing a lot of incredible work um, and they were really trying to build socialism from the ground up. Moss is a party that is very much rooted in class and rooted in the social organizations. Those relationships did start to crumble in the past few years of Evo Morales's um, rule, right? I'm not saying he deserved the coup. I'm not even making a big criticism of Evo Morales. This is a process and it's a long process to build socialism and socialist politics. Uh, so what ends up happening with Evo Morales is that that relationship starts to wane. But because they had established that relationship and because they had built out of that relationship, during the coup government, those social forces were able to reignite themselves and to remobilize and to reorganize until they were able to build uh, a crashing wave and a social movement that was able to topple the Anes government and bring in Moss back into political power today, right? And a Moss that is much stronger than the Moss that was in power uh, before the coup either, because that connection uh, to the base is much, much stronger. Um, so we need to understand that if we want to start building more radical politics in the United States, it's one, it's going to be an uphill battle, but to be able to push through the radical demands that we want, the radical ideas that we have, uh, we need to, uh, to quote, uh, you know, uh, uh, to quote Donald Trump, oh, you know, we need to move past like the idea stage, right? Like we need to also start building the, the organization stage. Like building socialist politics is much more than just having a slate of the right ideas. Syriza was a party, it was an organization that had plenty of right ideas, but they had lost the, the, the connection to the how which is the social movements. You have to have both of those forces, people coming into power to be able to use state power to realize socialist demands and also have that tied with robust social movements that can start to form the new way of being, the new social order that we're trying to build as socialists. And that's the real difference between class-rooted and class-focused politics that we just need to have as we're trying to build movements in the United States today. Yeah, behind me, I put up this book from 2014. It's uh, University of Texas Press, so there are probably more radical treatments out there. But a couple of the chapters, um, Reinventing the State, uh, Expanding Rights, and Navigating Democracy, and Captured capturing or captured by power like a lot of these tensions are exactly the ones like panich and gindin are talking about mm -hmm. in um the socialist uh, what is that the socialist problem today the challenge, socialist today, challenge so. today yeah and you know these are just the kind of questions that we're going to start to work through on on these griscom streams that i'm going to try to do either mondays or tuesdays i guess people let me know which worked better for them I'm, I'm fairly flexible though i prefer tuesday um you know, I'm going to start going through this question of of the party because you know a lot of people think that we're just going to be able to get the party and these things are going to solve themselves, right? Uh, I'm telling you, they won't. You have to have this really complex approach to politics, uh, you know, which can be a little frustrating. But I'm sorry, y'all, there aren't easy answers to this. We have to build these really strong social bases and these really strong movements that have been purposefully decimated uh, by years and years of neoliberal capital because they understand that's where our power lies. Um, and we also can't delude ourselves to such an extent that we don't recognize how important it is also to try to wield state apparatus powers um, when when we have the ability to to as well. Well said. All right. Well, uh, with that said, I think it's time for us to uh, bring on our next guest. I believe he's uh, here with us now. Uh, Edward Angueso Jr. He is the tech and labor writer for uh, Vice uh, Motherboard. Uh, who, to my ears, has been universally described as killing it over there. He's also the co-host alongside Jathan Sadowski of a podcast that I've been binging through the back catalog of uh, This Machine Kills on topics of tech and political economy that you can pause the show and go subscribe to now. Edward, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Um, so I wanted you on because, to talk about Section 230 because it's something we've been hearing a lot about, those of us who are on the internet for mm -hmm. the past year. Uh, Trump gave us the all caps revoke section 230 uh, tweet with the three exclamation points. Biden also said he wanted it revoked, but in a smarter way than Trump does. And now Steven Crowder says that he is kind of turning on <laughs> Trump because he didn't do enough about section 30 when he was in office. So what is section 30 and why is it so important to tech and Silicon Valley and our social media platforms? So Section 230 is, you know, a pretty small law that came about, I think, about in uh, 1996. And it's, you know, in a, um, 
basically saying right that providers of internet server or providers of like an interactive computer service are going to be allowed to be treated um, as a publisher or that they're not going to be treated as a publisher sorry um, or you know as a presenter of um, information provided by another internet uh, content or information content provider, right? So basically, it just means that you know you and I we're you know responsible for the stuff that we put on the internet or liable for it. But if you know a platform hosts it or republishes it, if we host or republish, you know, then only the people who posted that information to begin with are legally mm -hmm. responsible. And I think that you know this law has been pretty integral to allowing for. Sorry, my cat. <laughs> <laughs> that's really what we're talking about. Yeah, cat. Especially that's a Russian blue. Totally yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, he can. He cannot get an. He can't be away from me for a second. But um, so you know, it's it's been pretty integral to allowing uh, large sections of the internet to exist because it allows people to basically speak without you know immediately being punished or censored. Um, and I think over the past year, there've been attempts and jockeying to expand carve outs or bargaining chips mm. uh, to the law. Um, you know, there was already, um, you know, FOSTA, which was uh, pretty much a, a law that uh, Congress passed and was signed under Donald Trump uh, to uh, move against any site that was, you know, you know, seen as aiding or hosting, you know, uh, prostitution, right? And that justified a crackdown on um, not only just a crackdown on sex workers through, you know, sites like Backpage, but also because it opens up the door for uh, any sort of ambiguous treatment to then, uh, you know, perpetually expand you know, censorship. And this is a problem, you know, with Section 230 because, uh, a lot of the discourse has been, all right, well, we need to amend it to get rid of censorship. We need to amend it to uh, improve content moderation, right? But these are problems that when they get paid attention to are pretty political, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I think a really good example is of when Trump was, uh, you know, got COVID, Right, and people <laughs> were you know, celebrating or you know openly calling for him to you know die from COVID uh, at the time, and um, Twitter you know took pains to remind people uh, that you know you're not allowed to do that. That violates our rules. But as anyone who uses Twitter knows, right, if you are um, you know pretty vocal leftist, or if you're no, if you're a woman, or you know if you're queer. Or you know, anything that is or any group, you know, or in any marginalized group, you're going to, you know, face the sort of behavior that when happened with Donald Trump was enforced or threatened with enforcement by Twitter. You know, these sorts of things, this, this selective enforcement mm -hmm. is a huge problem uh, serving, I, I guess, as guardrails for the discourse about Section 230 and whether or not to amend it or not. So what do you think the right wants from Section 230? Like, what what are they, uh, you know, because I, I, I take it you don't take the conservative, anti-conservative biased uh, statements at face value. Right. You know, the conservative argument stems from a misunderstanding of it um, and also uh, cynical deployment. Um, you have people like uh, Hawley or William Barr when he was the head of uh, the DOJ insisting that, uh, platforms be politically neutral or that they, you know, create bipartisan, um, you know, commissions to ensure that they're neutral um, and that they stop, you know, preventing people from showing up on Google searches. But, you know, in reality, it's there's not a political bias, right? The the conservatives, I think, are cynically using it or trying to cynically use it as a part, as a, you know, as an attempt to seize the moment, right, with uh, general anti-tech um like this phase or this wave of anti-tech sentiment or corporate tech sentiment, right? Um, and have also attempted to use it to, you know, wage their own crusades, right? You know, Hawley and his own crusade with uh, groups that are trying to, you know, get rid of uh, sex work, you know, uh, get rid of pornography, um, you know, other senators uh, with their, you know, seeking to institute bargaining chips with like, you know, earn it to ensure that there's more, st uh, action on by platforms taken to uh, you know moderate and prevent child pornography or unconsensual material uh, and content from being on the platform 
but I think it's safe to say, you know, the right and to an extent the Democrats as well, you know, there's a lot of misinformation about Section 230 and also a lot of cynical deploy or attempts to, you know, deploy it, to carve it out, to undermine it, um, that are a real problem. Because if you really are concerned about the internet, about content moderation, about power of political platforms, you know, there are other things that we should also be looking at. We should be looking at the monopoly issue, right? We should be mm -hmm. looking about how to regulate them, if they should be common carriers, if they should be public utilities. You know, there are a host of other things that get to the heart, some of the hearts, uh, the heart of some of the problems, right? Um, and Section 230 ends up being, I think, a scapegoat um, as a result of it. Mm. So, and, you know, on the, on the flip side, uh, you know, we have seen, um, you know, signaling from Biden around Section 230, but I know uh, Gina Romano, who uh, we've talked a lot about the, the incoming Treasury, mm -hmm. um, sorry, Commerce Secretary, mm -hmm. um, also signaled that she'd be interested in changing 230. From the Democratic Party side, uh, you know, where do you think their logic or, or desire to, you know, repeal 230 is coming from? I think a lot of the Democrats are want to repeal it in the name of protecting uh, communities that they think are being harmed by some uh, way. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think often, as we saw with FOSTA, right, uh, the what the Democrats are, you know, end up actually doing is, you know, hurting uh, the very people that they're saying they're trying to defend, you know. Um, they helped amplify, accelerate, you know, the deplatforming of uh, sex workers. And, and there are also other issues that they don't, that do not fall into the purview that are not the same as, you know, um, for example, uh, the child pornography uh, content mm -hmm. moderation that they're concerned with. But still, there's, there's no question about, okay, well, you know, if we have, if we give the, if we take steps to make sure that the platforms, you know, are doing some of these fixes like ensuring identities or verifying identities, you know, there was a wave of, um, of uh, you know, account deactivations on Facebook when, you know, people who are indigenous or drag performers were, you know, getting, you know, their accounts suspended because Facebook, you know, mm -hmm. decided the name wasn't a real name. Um, you know, there are a lot of, you know, uh, I think complexities and nuances to the issue that Democrats suffer from the same sort of misconceptions as Republicans about, yeah. about Section 230. And I think that there's also the fact that, you know, coming out of the election, right, the law and the, you know, speech on platforms was seen as integral to, you know, the healthiness of our republic or of the democracy of the election. Um, in ways that short circuited what we should have, like more vibrant, more vibrant discussions that should have been had about how do we actually do content moderation? What role should the platforms have in our daily lives? What scale are we comfortable with them um, uh, being? Uh, what, like, you know, accountability, you know, what sort of incentives, what sort of regulations do we want to have for them? Going steps further than, uh, you know, the simple carve outs uh, to yeah. uh, 230. Because it worries me now, because we it was I've seen it framed as Biden and Trump versus Mark Zuckerberg. It's <laughs> cutting. It was biting my <laughs> my hand a little too much. Um, I've seen it framed as like Biden and Trump versus Mark Zuckerberg. But even Zuckerberg is like, yeah, we need to tinker with Section two hundred and thirty. And I mean, that concerns me because why does Mark Zuckerberg all of a sudden get a seat at the table if it, basically he's grown to a monopoly because on the backs of this policy now he gets to. Uh, you know, figure out how the new regime is going to set up. Is there any like, you know, is it what, um, you know, let's talk about some of those things that should be done. Is it, you know, breaking up the advertising side of these um, platforms? Like, is it enforced transparency? What are the things that you're kind of interested in besides the Section 230 stuff? You know, in my in my ideal world, advertising would be illegal, but we're not there yet. So, <laughs> um, so I do think that, uh, you know, with a lot of these firms, spinoffs are in the cards and need to happen, not only of the consumer uh, products that they have, you know, with Facebook spinning off WhatsApp and, um, and Instagram, uh, but also I think real, you know, thought needs to be put into the advertising um, unit and, rev and technology that they have, right? Uh, I'm still not convinced that global social media platforms and communities should exist at the scale of Facebook given that, you know, the content moderation problem has proven to be intractable uh, this time. And if that's the case, right, I mean, we don't have to immediately break, uh, you know, 
ban people from speaking to each other from other countries, but we need to be more willing to experiment with um, and get wrong or get right um, alternatives to the structure that we have. I think a lot of the attitude that we have today with technological innovations is that if we can envision it, then it, we can have it. And if we can like build it, then it's fine, right? But in a lot of these instances, you know, as we've seen with Facebook, you know, as you know, the perfect example here, um, it, I don't think it, I don't think looking at Facebook, you can say that it should exist holistically with its advertising intact, with its ability to reach billions of people intact, with the multiple other, you know, applications that it has that, you know, feed data or, you know, exchange data or port over data eventually. Um, and so I'm interested, yeah, definitely in spinning off and in antitrust, also thinking about whether they need to be it needs to be nationalized or whether it needs to be municipalized because there are different forms of ownership right i think a lot of people when they hear uh, public ownership they just think specifically only like the you know dc will control it right but there are other alternatives where we we could experiment with where it could be operated at a local level at a statewide level uh, where the infrastructure is owned by a municipality instead of the private corporation or maybe by the federal government. I mean, there are all sorts of alternatives we should pursue so that we don't fall in the trap of, you know, these some of the, you know, the worst nightmares or outcomes, right, where you might have just a federal Facebook that is run by everybody and also just as cozy as it was during uh, the PRISM, you know, program with uh, federal authorities, right? You want to have something that is public in the sense that it can be free and accessible to everybody and, and insulated from corporate, um, you know, influence and the dynamics of being on a marketplace. And you also want it to be insulated from the ability of the state to use it for intelligence services, for political censorship, for uh, suppression mm -hmm. of ideas and thoughts. And that's like, there's no real easy fix. That's something we're only going to get through experimentation. And, and, and that's something too, that I think is worthwhile for people on the left, like the social stuff to think about as well, right? Because I know a lot of times people use the word nationalization as like it's going to be a catch-all solution. Uh, but as you're pointing out, especially in the context mm -hmm. of where the socialist left is today, um, you know, nowhere near in power. And there's, a, you know, there's a reason that, uh, you know, the people in power, both Biden and Trump have been very threatened by, by social media, particularly like Washington DC Democrats did not like um, the restructuring of the media, right? The idea that you didn't have to go through the sort of the old guard to get your 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 voice out. Now, obviously, that comes with problems, but you know the solution here uh, for the left should not necessarily be to you know clamor and hope that a Joe Biden administration is going to be in a position right. where they're going to be able to you know pick legitimate and illegitimate uh, accounts. And yeah, as you're pointing to, it's it's a very tight uh, you know it's a tight rope, uh, you know, especially with what we're seeing, for example, in other countries. Uh, you know, in India right now, uh, you know, Twitter on the order of the Indian government uh, is, you know, is deleting and, and uh, you know, anti-Modi accounts. I believe they've been reinstated some of those and now Twitter's in a spat with the Modi government. Mm -hmm. um, but that's what could develop, for example, um, in a different context with the United States, if the U.S. government were to be more interested in pressuring those platforms to sort of, you know, target uh, certain individuals or at least ideologies. And, and in all fairness, they already do. Uh, people on the left, you know, constantly are facing, uh, you know, censorship from these platforms. I know just the way that the algorithms work for Facebook, um, they're, they're not particularly neutral. Uh, I, I know plenty of left-wing publishers have seen their, their, their numbers just completely tank. Um, or, or be treated as, you know, fake news, right? Remember when, fa when Facebook was bringing in the fact checkers, mm -hmm. it's a difficult situation, right? Because the private sector and the, the government itself is not going to be fair arbiter there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it is, I think, um, I, th I think definitely it's like, you know, the best we can hope for with Joe Biden is not nationalization, right? It is that the FTC is staffed with aggressive commissioners like, you know, Lena Khan, you know, as one example, who help, you know, push along these lawsuits and antitrust reviews that break down um, and undermine key elements of Facebook's power that would then allow us to continue marching and dragging it, you know, kicking and screaming towards uh, various, you know, outcomes that we would want, right? If Facebook as it is right now, and political environment as it is right now, the Biden team, you know, filled with, you know, tech lawyers as it is right now, we are not, you know, mm -hmm. we're not, we're not getting any of that. And, and, and it's, 
it's uh it's still also at the point where you can speak about these alternatives and they're seen as ridiculous and that what that you know that what real savvy operators are thinking about is how to how to hire more people for content moderation how to you know ensure that platforms are more civil or how to ensure that they're not as uh, they're not hotbeds for racism, you know, or white supremacists or conspiracy theories. But, you know, there are also very deep, deep structural reforms and changes and withering away that needs to happen. And we're not, we're not there yet. But if we break, you know, some of the, some of these companies up, that would be a good, a strong first step as, as well as mm -hmm. bringing in also the ideas of people who are, you know, committed to breaking up that power and democratizing it. Um, Edward, tell us a little bit about This Machine Kills. Uh, I was just admiring one of the episodes. On, it kind of explained to me on uh, Shoshana Zuboff's Surveillance Capitalism how I could listen to that on Audible and never really find it useful to ever think about again. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, tell us a little about This Machine Kills. So uh, This Machine Kills is, um, you know, a podcast I'm doing with uh, Jathan and also his brother, Jeremy. And we are, you know, trying to sift through um, technology, not as some sort of um, divine concept or thing that we discover waiting for us at the end of history, but as like the consequence of decisions mm -hmm. and figuring out what decisions built, what technical systems prevent them from being changed and what decisions or actions have to be done to change them. Uh, and so we try to think about alternatives to existing systems undermine narratives about them um, and, you know, propose uh, other new ways of thinking about it. And I think, you know, our episode with Zuboff, uh, Zuboff's surveillance capitalism is a good one because I think surveillance capitalism is caught in on with a lot of people's little shorthand way of discussing uh, the way in which tech giants and corporate tech firms um, have mediate most of our daily lives and have you know twisted the political system or you know taken control of the political system it seems right mm -hmm. um you know but one thing you do when you look through i mean you can look at you know some of the discussion of this book inside of the field itself and there's a lot of frustration with uh what seems to be a lack of engagement with the, the scholarship but that's a separate issue the main concern we have is that it proposes a model surveillance capitalism that uh, actually falls in line with a, a long series of attempts to naturalize capitalism, you know, um, whether it is to naturalize um, the worst excesses uh, of any particular epoch, whether it's in the industrial era or, you know, or, or the epoch of the industrial revolution, whether it's in like the advent of the corporation or of managerial, you know, managerial capitalism to say that, you know, the worst things that we're seeing in any particular system are excesses and they're not endemic to capitalism. Capitalism mm. is not inherently exploitative. It's not inherently ex extractive. It's not inherently destructive. It's that these firms got way too big, way too successful and changed the way everybody does business. Um, you know, surveillance capitalism in of itself is like a term that I think is taken from a much richer, much more historically uh, cognizant uh, framework that was in monthly review um, in the early 2010s, I think, uh, where they argue that, you know, capitalism after the golden age or, or, you know, with the advent of the golden age, increasingly needed to uh, surveil and, mit and manage populations um, to ensure that they would keep up productivity, to ensure that they would keep up consumption, and to ensure mm -hmm. that they would minimize, you know, political agitation. Um, and that surveillance capitalism should speak to the ways in which, you know, advertising, uh, as an example, um, needed certain surveillance technologies um, or surveillance technologies and, and logics to encourage people to act in specific ways, to live in specific ways, um, and to, um, you know, feed into, you know, the, uh, the economy in specific ways that would keep the engine growing and keep growth going at art, you know, at rates that were sustainable for the prosperity that everyone was enjoying. Mm -hmm. Similarly, when we think of like financial, the, the financial bubbles or the financial uh, system or financial capitalism, right? That uh, s surveillance was implemented there to ensure that very risky, very abstract, very uh, potentially dangerous financial products were managed, uh, surveilled, that the people, you know, being sold them or, you know, who were taking part in them were also managed and, and surveilled and disciplined so that it wouldn't blow up the whole system. Mm. And that can be applied 
to the modern day and the tech uh, and the advent of like these personal consumer technologies and also the advertising technologies. Uh, mm -hmm. But it is a mistake to really zoom in and say it's because of like you know Google and Facebook or it's because. Right. Amazon created Alexa, or I mean, like those are simplifications. He has a whole, you know, framework and argument. But I think, like, our thesis is just that, you know, Zubov's, you know, framework is a little too conveniently exonerative of capitalism and right. comes down hard on very specific firms. Right. And you should zoom out and look at the history of it and see that this is just the latest phase of how capitalism has operated and that if we really want to fix it can't blame it on facebook and google we have to blame it you know on the structure itself absolutely well edward angueso jr uh at big black jacobin on twitter check him out at this machine kills and motherboard at vice um thank you so much edward thanks for having me on thanks so much um yeah, excellent stuff. I mean, the, the, I just uh, say as a person who's been doing these sort of streams for a while, um, mm -hmm. so much of uh, our analysis is built on the these writers who do a lot of daily work on uh, deep analysis on this stuff. And Edwards as good as they uh, uh, come. Uh, we have our second guest uh, here now. I believe in the waiting room. I'm going to bring him on now. Uh, here he is. Hey. Hey, how's it going, guys? Hey, welcome to great. welcome to Left Reckoning, Kenzo. Uh, for those listening, Kenzo is a teacher, a member of the Chicago Teachers Union, uh, Chicagoan, and uh, hosts the Class Time Pod, which is a great show. I've been a guest on before. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Matt. Are you a Cubs fan? Uh, you know, I my dad is a big Cubs fan. I buy hats from wherever, whatever sport events I'm lucky enough to attend. So <laughs> I, I have, I was gonna troll you with a White Sox hat, but I'm like, no, nah, I want to get invited back. So I, I, <laughs> I'm neutral with the Bulls. <laughs> uh, Bulls, Bulls are cool, um, but yeah, I wouldn't have been offended by a White Sox. <laughs> <laughs> Man, well, Kenzo, I mean, there's there's a lot to a lot to get to, and. Uh, hmm. I'm I'm really happy that you're able to take some time to join us uh, tonight because this is a really important issue. Um, you know, I think if we could just start broad for a second, for someone who might not be keeping up with what's happening in Chicago, can you paint the general picture okay. um, between the struggle between the city and the uh, and, and the teachers union right now? We're in a very interesting position here, and I think we can probably back up later to talk about you know the politics and the history mm -hmm. leading up to this moment. But, you know, bottom line right now is Chicago Teachers Union, um, we uh, voted to remain teaching uh, virtually with our students. Mm -hmm. And the Board of Education is trying to slowly fold in uh, teachers back into the classroom. And the problem with that is, is we don't have, well, I mean, we're in a pandemic. That's, that's number one. But two, even some very basic uh, PPE uh, distancing measures, they won't be in place. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we'll have situations where there are students who have exemptions to even wearing a mask uh, in class. Uh, so it's just not the right time right now, specifically with the vaccine mm -hmm. um, existing and slowly being rolled out in our city. Uh, the mayor said by like late spring, you know, all the teachers will be uh, vaccinated. And she still is insisting that we go to in-person uh, teaching at this moment. So we voted to continue to do distance uh, teaching as a, as a union. And um, what they have been doing is they locked out some teachers from the Google Classrooms. And that oh, was, Lord. you know, their way of forcing us from working. Um, so, you know, we're at a place now where um, we're saying as a union, if they lock out any more teachers, we are going to go out on strike. Um, that mean, I'm a high school teacher. I'm not even um, required to go back to the classroom yet, but I will be striking with my sisters and brothers uh, if it comes down to it. And, uh, you know, on top of these demands to make sure that, you know, basic like safety measures have been have been met, there's been a, a big fight over just making sure that people who have family members who have, you know, severe or chronic in um you know, illnesses are protected and those teachers don't have to go, you know, back into the classroom or where they could, you know, hypothetically bring the virus back home to people who really would struggle uh, with dealing with COVID, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, that, I mean, that's the position that I'm in. Uh, my wife has stage four breast cancer. And uh, so, I mean, she's immunocompromised. Um, so I have a, 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 an eight-year-old. 
Mm-hmm. He's in second grade. Um, even looking beyond the fact that uh, she's immunocompromised and it'd be unsafe for me to bring um, COVID back um, from the classroom, it's just not practical. Like mm-hmm. she's going through chemotherapy. I need to be home to help my son with his studies as I, you know, teach my own classes. And, mm-hmm. you know, bosses will be bosses and say, like, we don't care about your home life, but this is a crisis. And I mean, that's one of the big issues. That's the overarching issue is that we're in a crisis. We have a mayor that won't admit that, you know, this is deeply impacting human lives and, you know, wants to force the schools open. Um, Mm -hmm. And she doesn't have a good reason for it either. Um, Oh, so go ahead. I was going to say, can you talk a little bit about uh, Mary, Mary Lori Lightfoot? Um, I heard you on District Sentinel earlier in the week, and the um, I guess she was a little bit even behind Biden and Harris, who had been, I guess, pressured to come out in support of the strikes. Where are, the, the, I guess, those three politicians? Has there been any development there? Where is Lori Lightfoot still just deaf to all this stuff? And have Biden and Harris done anything more in support of you guys or the party yeah. in general? Um, yeah, so what happened was, um, you know, Joe Biden has one of his 100 days in office promises was um, to open up all the schools within, you know, the first 100 days. And, you know, I took immediate umbrage to that because 100 days, that's that's a political goal. It's not a pedagogical goal. It's not, um, you know, a public safety goal. That's just, you know, it's an arbitrary number he's throwing out there. and so that became kind of the the line of the Democratic Party, including my union president, Randy Weingarten from the AFT, not the local president. We have a very fighting, awesome local leadership, but the national leadership, Randy Weingarten actually put out an op-ed uh, saying that we need to go back to in-person as long as there's good testing being done. Um, and that was not the line from our rank and file. And then later that day, Joe Biden offhandedly at a press conference was asked, how do you feel about the situation? And he was on our side. He said, I support the Chicago teachers. They just want to teach safely, but, you know, but they they do want to teach. And that we thought that was that was huge. Like, I, you know, the way I looked at it was Joe Biden did a political analysis and Lori Lightfoot does not have a political base in Chicago. She won kind of on a fluke. Maybe get into that later. Um, and, you know, by doing a political analysis calculus, he probably thought, you know, I should support the CTU in here. And this actually goes back to the, the strike we were on last year, which was just a more typical contract strike, Mm -hmm. um, where every candidate except for Tulsi Gabbard and Pete Buttigieg, um, sends some sort of support to us. We were out. Bernie, of course, did the most. Mm-hmm. Came out the night of our strike vote, rallied with us. He used his email list to get people out to support our strike lines. But then I think people saw the kind of uh, support he was getting here from a big voting block, not just a big voting block, but the CTU is a big door knocking and phone calling and texting block. Mm-hmm. And that's just how I, I see. Probably he made that calculus. And, um, it was interesting because then the mayor had a hard deadline for us going back to the classroom. She's moved it three times this week. And um, today was actually supposed to be the day she locked out teachers. So uh, find out a little later tonight um, how many, if any, were locked out. And, and as a union, we're going to talk about next steps. Interesting. Maybe is, now's a good time to talk about um, what are Lori Lightfoot? What is, who does she represent? Yeah. So Chicago is in this really interesting juncture. My friend Mm -hmm. Ramson Cannon wrote this piece called Outlaw Country for the Midwest Socialist. And, you know, what he was basically saying in there is that we're no longer in a place where we have a social safety net or even like security. Um, I I don't don't want to say the security state is good, but like we don't even have one that works. Like look at January 6th. Mm -hmm. And kind of the, the bottom line of this piece is that you know, what we have is solidarity. You know, we can't count on institutions. Um, you know, institutions failed us on, on COVID. It, it failed us on COVID multiple times. Um, so we're in this position where we just have to, to fight whenever we uh, see things. But um, where we got here in Chicago was we had a mayor, um, we had Mayor Washington, who came out of the the ashes of the old machine 
Um, and he was a truly, his uh, base was truly a coalition of um, liberals, leftists, um, black community leaders, Latino community leaders. It was kind of, I think, what we need to be looking at building again. Um, and he, you know, he was very smart. He was also a guy with like, he's a Chicago guy with um, just really sharp elbows. Like, you know, he's going to get in a room and he's going to cut in the room and, you know, his presence is going to be known. He is, he's known as a guy that would publicly embarrass Jesse Jackson on the stage because he hated Jesse Jackson, you know, a real tough son of a gun. And, but also like very progressive, not a leftist or a socialist, but this is this huge left and, uh, you know, um, coalition came together and got him elected, got him a couple of, um, you know, got him reelected. He worked a lot in Springfield, uh, our, our state capital, to get uh, legislation passed because there was this big racist block of aldermen who would not get him anything passed in city council. Hmm. And uh, we still have the ghosts, their ghosts and their skeletons. Uh, yeah. Uh, haunting us mm -hmm. um, some of them are still alive actually and then you know, after he died that became this swing backwards to mayor richard daly's son who lost against washington in his in his second go at it and um people wanted stability it seemed at that point people got this was like the late 80s mm -hmm. in chicago crime was pretty high but there was a lot of progress i think being done that had Harold Washington lived longer or if they built a stronger coalition to outlive him, we could have built something bigger than a, the rebuild machine. But what Mayor Daly did, the second was he built this neoliberal machine where he still had his power base in the neighborhoods, but his money was still was coming from like DC, New York, and from, mm. you know, uh, his brother was CEO of Chase at one point, Chase Bank. Um, they were all tied together. And then um, he stepped down um, and Rahm Emanuel came in and he was completely neoliberal, but he had so much money, he could just throw it at elections and he you know, maintained a majority in city council that way and totally fucked the city and uh, he covered the murder of a, of a black teenager up um, to get reelected. And then when that came out, that made him um, so hated. Mm -hmm. city and he left um very smartly i think he did some uh, political analysis on, on his own had his consultants crunch the numbers and realized he wasn't going to get reelected. our union president almost ran against him um uh, for his re-election karen lewis but then, um, unfortunately she uh, has brain cancer so she dropped out of the campaign that could have i think been a harold washington number two mm. if things you know happen right but what Ron left us with uh, was a city that hated the machine and wanted to see change and wanted to see something that looked nothing like Ron Manuel. Laura Lightfoot had no political past. Mm -hmm. She was a prosecutor. She was a corporate lawyer. So she campaigned on something that looked really good on $15 minimum wage, uh, putting nurses and uh, social workers in schools, everything that the union was even asking for. And we backed Tony Preckwinkle, who was the Cook County Board president, she still is, and the head of the Cook County Board Democrats. Now, with the machine crumbling as it is, I thought she was the best bet, Tony Preckwinkle, because her only support at that point were the unions and the progressive works. So I think we would have had some unaccountable mayor under her. With Lori Lightfoot, she took real umbrage to us, the unions and the progressive works, not endorsing her. Mm. Supporting her, and she she came into office very bitter. Um, she forced Tony Preckwinkle into this runoff, and uh, only you know with only eighteen percent of the vote. But Tony Preckwinkle was connected to this very corrupt alderman named Ed Burke, and that was basically what uh, Lori Lightfoot did to win was to say I'm not connected to Ed Burke, and she took advantage of this this uh, anti machine swing in the city. Um, Silver lining to that anti-machine uh, swing in the city, and you know this outlaw country we're in is ten percent of our city council are DSA members now. Mm -hmm. Wow.
Yeah, no, and it's like I was I was going to mention too, like Chicago in a lot of ways has become such a a hotbed of not just the progressive movement, but most, you know, directly and importantly, in my opinion, you know, the democratic socialist movement and that actual taking that next step from, you know, protest movement, social movements to power. Um, let me see, because I, I, I wanted to, to make sure uh, that we're, we're hitting on like all these conditions as well, because, you know, just like, how would you categorize the support that you have already gotten from the school system as a teacher? Um, before this debacle, before, you know, how have they been and actually, you know, providing people to prepare them for online learning, right? Has that been mm -hmm. satisfactory in, in your opinion so far? I think that what's the way that the, the schools have handled the pandemic is just like, it, it's an analogy to the way everyone, every, you know, system and every mm -hmm. government has handled the pandemic. It's kind of pretend like it's not happening and then try to put band-aids on it. Um, and it's really shown naked, like all the frailties in our system. Mm. And one of the things that I think is really, was really striking to me, uh, I was talking to a friend of mine who's a social worker at DPS. And when we were funding for a contract last year, we were fighting to have one social worker in every building. And one of the things that pisses me off is that we won that and we took a lot of, uh, I mean, we made concessions for it, but, um, the, the, you know, the, the boards that maintain that we can't afford to hire them all, um, you know, at, you know, at once. So we, we conceded to like have them folded in, but that was the floor that should have been like, you know, the board of education could have staffed a social worker in every building. We had a billion dollar um, surplus last year hmm. uh, and the board and they, they could have totally done that, but they chose to like do the bare minimum, which is slowly fold them in. And when I was talking to my social worker friend, she was saying, even if we were to uh, staff one social worker for every school, that's uh, 10 times the caseload recommended by her professional organization. Hmm. That, um, you know, it'll be one student for every, I'm sorry, one social worker for every 500 uh, students, which is 10 times what's recommended. <laughs> like if you have 100 students in a school, you should have two. Yeah. I mean, I, I just bring this up because, you know, as these negotiations go on, the, the media blitz that I've seen, you know, and I'm not in Chicago, uh, but from officials, you know, in the Lightfoot administration, also, you know, from CPS uh -huh. as well, have been really frustrating, um, you know, including, uh, let me get the, the quote right, because it I infuriated me so much, um, you know, Janice Jackson, uh, you know, saying that because, you know, the teachers are stalling countless Black and Latinx families are falling behind, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's just one of those moments where clearly uh, those systems weren't reaching, you know, weren't doing enough for those communities beforehand. And then to put, uh, you know, the blame on that on teachers who are making sure that their like life mm -hmm. and their family's life and their community's life are kept safe is just so despicable. Yeah. On that note, talk about like we hear a lot, like Michael Bloomberg in the news today demanding teachers get back to work. Um, talk about what you're actually hearing from like the parents mm -hmm. of the uh, students you teach. Well, 80% of parents opted out of in person. And that number keeps climbing because parents are sending their kids to school. And then, you know, the kid would come back with a different mask on or something like that. There's always like some sort of reason why they're like oh it's not what we've been told and the reason why is principals they get sanctioned if they don't promote in-person learning they are middle management mm -hmm. so they um they have to talk to parents and email parents about how safe these schools are uh and you know i'm i'm a parent and i trust my principal in many ways um as a, as a cps teacher i don't trust principals to be quite honest they're just fucking bosses but um you know, you, you, I would say, like, you choose a school that you mistrust the principal the least at when you're a CPS teacher. And, you know, I like, I like my, my kid's principal. Um, my own principal at my school for the first time in my life is good. Uh, but they, um, they have to sell it. And the only way parents get the good information is either through the teachers. Um, and, you know, there's eyes on us a lot of times um, through the union. Um, and through other parents. And like, for example, my wife is on the local school council, um, which are like mini school boards that each school has. We don't have an elected school board for the entire city. 
Mm -hmm. Each school has one that makes certain decisions. And she's also a, a room mother, or I guess Zoom mother in these conditions. Um, but like because of that, she has contact information from all the parents. And she's not afraid. She's a union. She was a former union organizer. She's not afraid to get political. Mm -hmm. And so she's having one on one organizing conversations with parents. And I'm not saying it's like a widespread thing that's happening, but in the last 10 years, I've seen more of that where parents are not afraid to get political with each other. Teachers are not afraid to get political talking to parents. Mm. And um, I mean, that's just one of those things like, you know, you're not supposed to talk about religion or politics at the dinner table. We have to mm. get past that. And, you know, because that's us educating their kids by like safeguarding them and making mm -hmm. sure their learning conditions are proper. So we have to like break through that, uh, that fear. Um, mm. And, uh, you know, that's, that's the, the what's, what's been getting the, the messages through. Um, so yeah, 20% signed up for in person, but that number keeps dropping and uh, they, they keep counting these numbers and um, mm -hmm. it just not ma matching up. Like when I talk to my students, I have seniors, um, mainly black and Latinx students, um, working class and poor. Uh, they're, they're, they're sad about missing prom say about missing graduation but they understand mm -hmm. and my read on it is they understand because they all have a covid story they've had covid their families had covid they've lost people to covid and the communities that are sending their kids to school um i'm just thinking they're not as touched by it hmm. i mean i think that's that's definitely i mean knowing people in north dakota i think that you have you have certain people who their COVID story is they know somebody who got it and got better, but that's really all the COVID stories they have, which is, mm. and I think it's much easier for those people to say like, come on, it's a lot of people are in denial about the reality of this uh, illness, but certain communities can't be because you all of a sudden will know one or two people at least that died from it. Um, yeah, Jesus. Oh. Well, I think it, just on a, on, a, on a little bit of a, a lighter note, at least if, if Matt has this, uh, this piece of sound ready. Um, there were some pretty incredible allegations and I know I, I really appreciate you taking the time uh, to join us tonight, taking time from walking the beautiful beaches of Florida uh, from your second home. Oh. Um, <laughs> this, this, this is real rich. But we have this, if you go down the second uh, tweet, Matt, this, uh, the piece of sound. Oh God. Yeah. One second. Uh, it's, it's a pretty rich thing that we're getting from Fox news, which, you know, I hate to amplify it, but it's just ridiculous because one thing that is so important about the teachers unions and, and thank you, Sirius Kenzo for joining us and also for your work, because it's really important to, you know, to our future and, and to the community. Um, and, and a lot of people recognize that and teachers unions have incredible power because they are very respected in the community. And you really have to dig to the bottom of the barrel to get, get these kind of ghouls to go on television, to tell lies about teachers, people who are literally, you know, not getting paid very well for their work um, and putting themselves in this situation in the front lines of a of a you know health pandemic but anyways i don't want to ramble too much but this is such a good clip here uh, from fox news and uh let me just give me one second here. okay uh it'll, okay here we go <laughs> yeah, so uh, where, where does the teachers union stand on the second Florida homes demand? Uh, <laughs> home. So Amy Jacobson was a local reporter who like was very well respected and did like investigative reports and won a lot of awards. And a rival local station caught her in a bikini at the house of the husband whose wife disappeared and she was working on that story oh lord i'm just putting facts out i'm just putting the facts i'm not i'm not i'm not uh, alleging anything beyond that um because i don't want to get sued she actually sued the other um uh, uh, tv station and lost in court 
uh, over defamation because they said they're a public figure. And I guess the judge like like really uh, get into her about you know being you know a respected journalist and and taking and doing all that. And so she rebranded herself at that point, like 2008, as a right wing radio talk show, the local one, where like she her tone changed, like she she got that Fox kind of gruff like, uh, SJW kind of thing. And then um, I, the only thing I'm guessing is this is her audition for Fox News National. And so I had to like retweet it with, you know, the old story and she got pissed at me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to play it again for folks because apparently I didn't share the audio correctly. So just mm -hmm. uh, so the chat uh, is say that. Well, now you have more context. <laughs> what, do you, what do you think the real reason is if they keep changing their argument? Why don't they want to go back? Well, I think a lot of people enjoy working from their homes in Florida and their homes in California, their second homes. And I talked to one teacher at Lane Tech who said, oh, I love staying at home because then I could go work out and I don't have to shower and I could just go straight to the Zoom classroom. So this I'll, is- I do that. Kids, Ainsley, this is always- <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I must say, isn't that pretty relatable? I that's love. Probably, yeah, that's extremely relatable. <laughs> I like not having a shower before a majority report every day. I think it's one of the best things about the pandemic, frankly. But um, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's also a big leap between like enjoying not having to sh like you know shower in the morning versus having a second home in California and or yes. Florida. <sighs> that was she really overplayed her hand yeah. there and. <laughs> She followed me on Twitter after I roasted her. Then I had to soft block her because I, mean, I guess she was just trying to like keep an eye on what I was doing. I'm like, I'm not going to real block mm -hmm. her because then she'll do an alt or something. <laughs> right wing Chicago people are a weird breed. I do not recommend being anywhere near them. <laughs> man, it makes it makes a ton of a, sen a lot of sense to me, man. It's an interesting. It's definitely an interesting place. I love Chicago, though, man. I uh, I've been lucky to be able to spend a lot of time there. Um, uh, like last couple of years, yeah, I love the city, man. Then, oh man, Kenzo, uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us this evening. I really appreciate it. Hopefully, we can uh, do it again sometime soon, and you know, yeah, cool. Joke around a little bit more, and I have to talk all about all these serious <laughs> life or death issues, yeah. and you know, all solidarity um, with you and your family and the union in this fight, brother. Absolutely. Right. Thanks so much for having me, on, guys. Thanks, and, Kendall. Uh, I'll, I'll be an update later because I'm about to hop into an executive board meeting at the union. All right. <laughs> Virtual Good luck, um, and oh, Ken, what's Kenzo's uh, Twitter uh, for people who want to follow him? It's, I believe it's Kenzo Shibata. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There you go. Yeah, just All my right. name. All right. Thanks, Kenzo. All right. Peace, guys. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Kenzo, Kenzo's a good dude, man. And I'm, yeah. yeah. He also does uh, Twitch, I believe. So people, I'm not sure if I have his Twitch uh, handy, but uh, it's class okay. time. It's class, class time. It's right, right. It's exactly class time is a good time. <laughs> <laughs> Did you just make um, make that up? I, I'm, I'm sure they've someone else has come up with that before. Oh, there um, you go. Well, no, it's a fun um, show, and he's a, he's a smart guy. Yeah, like Chicago is a really just incredible city. One of those uh, towns that really needs to you know have the spotlight on it more as we build this kind of democratic uh, socialist movement across the united states because they're doing the real work and they're do and really um up there with a lot of the you know of a lot of other cities that are doing a lot of great work um but they're they're really building those kind of community bases uh, for democratic socialist politics which i think is is really important and and on a, frankly unique uh, mm. to chicago versus many other places all right, right, man. Well, we got, um, I'm just preparing myself, taking some deep breaths because I got to tell people, you know, go through this story again. And it's, it's one that's hard uh, to do because it's one of those stories that we've known from the get go uh, where this was going to lead. When Joe Biden came out all strong in support of the $2,000 checks, um, you know, there was all this hope and all this fanfare. And how we've talked about this every week that we've had this show now um, that Joe Biden was going to deliver. And we're going to see this new era of progressive politics. Um, well, every step of the way, we've seen them walk back. They walked back initially uh, when they came back from the $1,400, uh, sorry, from the $2,000 checks to the $1,400 checks and then employed an army of just drooling asshole pundits trying to convince people who know exactly what he said um trying to convince them that they actually did not understand it correctly because they can't do math right just really bottom of the barrel nasty stuff um anyways we've seen over the past couple of weeks not only this initial move back from two thousand dollars to fourteen hundred dollars 
they are preparing themselves for a capitulation on this. The fight is not lost. Bernie Sanders is in the trenches. There are people who are trying to make sure that this doesn't happen. I mean, but, even Ossoff and Warnock, I mean, it's hard to know like who's been given permission to speak against it and mm -hmm. who's like actually fighting for it. Like I would imagine Bernie is. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's annoying um, what is the unelaborated positions, right? Like even Warnock and Ossoff are on board for this shit. And, but still it's, we're having negotiations against ourselves. And, and, yeah, ex exactly. They're negotiating against themselves, and I think that's exactly the right way to frame it. And we're going to come back um, after we play this sound, uh, you know, talk about this a little bit more. But I just want to like update folks because again, these negotiations are sort of happening, you know, in the back rooms. What we're getting more and more is that it looks like they're going to walk back, not just so they've already walked back from two thousand. Then they walk that down to 1400. And now what we're hearing is that deadly, deadly word in Democratic Party politics, targeted, right? And they're talking about targeting these payments, which means it's going to be lower and um, less and less people are going to get it. It will be a bureaucratic nightmare. Remember how difficult it was for them just to get people the $1,200 checks in the first place, particularly the people who needed it the most, right? Um, this to do this kinds of means testing is going to be another bureaucratic nightmare uh, to get it to folks who desperately need it when they have the power to get it out right away. They don't have to do any of this theater. They are just yeah. trying to to play with the devil um, because many of them are very much infatuated uh, with neoliberalism and austerity politics. And the main argument that we get right is this, oh, uh, we don't want people who are already comfortable, people who aren't suffering under this, uh, you know, COVID crisis to be getting the money, um, which is complete uh, BS. And we'll get to that after this this clip, actually, because this clip is very important to illustrate um, the walk back that we've seen over the past month from the Biden administration, which means, um, you know, which which you should hold um, in your heart as you get continually angry um, at this continued onslaught of people saying that the Biden administration is now going to be the most progressive left-wing administration we've had uh, since FDR, right? Because that's complete bogus. If you send John and the Reverend to Washington, those $2,000 che checks will go out the door. We will be able to pass $2,000 stimulus checks for the people next week. We'll deliver the $2,000 stimulus checks, and that begins with the $2,000 stimulus. When you send me and Reverend Warnock to the Senate, we will pass those $2,000 stimulus checks. You send me and Reverend Warnock to the Senate, we will pass those $2,000 stimulus checks. They will make decisions about whether we give people a $2,000 check. We need to pass $2,000 stimulus checks for the people we're getting people the two thousand dollars in relief direct payment congress should pass two thousand dollar checks president-elect biden and democrats are all pushing for two thousand dollar relief checks two thousand dollar stimulus checks two thousand dollar relief checks two thousand dollar relief checks they should send two thousand dollar checks to the american people right now we're supporting two thousand dollar relief payments right now we need to be passing the two thousand dollar stimulus relief checks that means we need john ossoff and Raphael warnock who will go to D.C. to ensure the $2,000 checks. You see ads that say, want your $2,000 stimulus check? Vote Democrat. Vote for Warnock. That's good. Yeah, and that can go on and on and on and on. Because well, you, you see why they had to at least give Warnock and Ossoff permission because like <laughs> they're all over media saying it. And and I want to make sure that uh, we shout out. That's from at Dems Watchdog uh, on on Twitter. Um, but look, it's it's a complete joke, especially one knowing the situation that we are in, right? Knowing how serious this crisis has affected people all across the country, and also knowing the disastrous legacy and history of means testing in the United States. What gets me really mad. Um, and I, I should note that there was a Mansion Collins amendment today uh, in the Senate to say that these checks now need to uh, can't should not go to the people at the upper income bracket. They did not define what that number means, which is why I'm saying that we still don't know what exactly is going on, but we know that they are preparing to negotiate from it. Um, negotiate down to so numbers I'm seeing as low as uh, as fifty thousand dollars income. So if you make um, more than fifty thousand dollars a year, you won't get any of that money, which is going to include a lot of people. 
um, which is extremely... Especially if they go based on 2019 uh, income. Exactly. Exactly. Which they uh, have been doing, and I mean, if I had to guess, I'd say the fifty is just to make it more palatable when they eventually put it at like seventy-five. But that's still too low, or but particularly or, when you count it that way. I think it's it's certainly too low, and it also I'm just saying like that extra hoop means that people are going to be left behind, right? And what and what pisses me off, so that that ended up passing. So again, it's a ninety-nine to one. It should also be be mentioned. Um, you know, so we we don't know what's going to happen in the negotiations. Hopefully, you know, the progressives are able to make sure that it doesn't get this bad. Uh, but all the signals that we're getting is that the administration is very willing to play ball on this. What pisses me off about people like Manchin, people who are making this argument, um, is the way that they frame it. They frame it as if like they're the actual class warriors. They're the people who are standing right. up for the little guy by doing this. So they say, give the people the people, um, give it to the people that deserve it. Don't give it to the people who have been comfortable this whole time. Um, first of all, we're talking about a small amount of money for the people at the very top. It's very important to remember um, just the massive gulf uh, in in, <laughs> in income in this country. The people who are at the top <laughs> or ner- like that this that they're talking about are so off the spectrum. It's almost not worth it to, to worry about. But let's say that Mansion is hundred percent for real when he's saying he wants to make sure that the people at the top aren't getting this thing. Why don't these Democrats start doing the thing that they get all rosy in the cheeks about when they say things like it's time for the rich to pay their fair share? Right. They love to say that. And then they they quake in their boots when it comes time to actually doing it, because here's what you can do. You give that check to every um, you know citizen in the country. Right. And I would also you know definitely argue that people who are non-citizens should get that, that money. Mm-hmm. As well. But, you know, but you give that money to everybody in the country. And then if you're so worried about the rich getting the money, then you take it back from them in taxes. Obviously. You raise their taxes to pay for it. And hell, you raise it even more if you're so worried now, Mansion and the Republican yeah. Party about inequities in the United States of America. It's BS. And, and we should 100% get on these guys, uh, you know, get on the Democrats um, about it who are, you know, waffling on it. But we really need to make sure that all these people who, you know, they beat their chest and they say, I'm going to make the, the rich pay their fair share. They need to be standing up and making that argument to Manchin and the Republicans and all these people who are getting away with this BS talking point. It's the, it's, a, it's the same argument against canceling student loan debt. It's like, well, if you're so upset with the high income earners that might have their debt canceled, tax their income, high incomes more. But like. <laughs> Like, yeah, get the money out the door. And then, I mean, the thing is, like, I got good news. We're overdue for raising taxes anyway. It has, like, (laughs) even before we had to do stimulus checks, we got to raise taxes severely, like, severely, severely on, you know, massive concentrations of wealth. And so, I mean, I don't see a problem here, really. Like, Mm -hmm. put the money out the door, um, you know, let people start paying down their fucking bills. um, And, then raise taxes on the wealthy and then we can even, you know, maybe do some more. It's, and yeah, I mean, that's the thing is like, we hear all this from Ossoff and Warnock and, um, and, and it's over. And all of a sudden we're for some reason, like the, the way we talk about politics in this country, like it, it does go to process and can this get the votes too much, but this it's really demonstrates how ludicrous that is when we mm-hmm. don't need Susan Collins. <laughs> like, like w- this entire charade, the whole point of w- Ossoff and Warnock wasn't to like, um, uh, it-, it was to avoid this situation mm-hmm. where we have to like bullshit around with Mansion. Two thousand checks will go, Collins. dollar checks will go out the door immediately. And of course, like the the truth is, the money part of the Democratic Party loves that. <laughs> All right, I mean that's why they created uh, in New York. That's why Cuomo did. Um, Oh, I'm even forgetting what it's called now. The Independent Leadership Council is that what? Oh it yeah, is? something like that. Yeah, the Independent um, Democratic Congress, uh, con- right? Congress, IDC, I, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, uh, th- this is yeah. The the Democrats are compromised by money and capital. A hundred percent. And I, I just want to say one more time: there is a special place in hell who for the people who only seem to be concerned about inequality in the United States of America when it comes time to opposing universal programs in this country. Mm-hmm which are by far the most effective um, programs that we do in in this country, and we don't do enough of them. Uh, Targeted programs have been a disaster, not only because they are inefficient, um, but because they create 
you know, they create stigma and all of these other problems as well. Um, so yeah, special place in hell for those people. And, you know, the transition to talk about another person who needs to see their entire wealth liquidated, uh, we got to talk about Jeff Bezos. I, um, I think, you know, it's one of those things where we can, I think every smart person out there understands that Jeff Bezos stepping down from, from Amazon, you know, stepping down is not, um, he's not going to separate himself from the company. He's still going to have a lot of say, he's still going to be very much, um, involved. Right. But let's pretend for a second that he actually was stepping back, right. And taking all of his wealth, um, with him, Amazon would not change. Because the reason that Amazon is a wicked and evil company um, is because it is a company that is extremely profitable and has a monopoly. And to do that, you have to be extremely wicked. Like, I think moral and personal critiques can be really helpful. Like, I loved when Bernie Sanders was coming at Bezos and all these other billionaires by name. I thought that's really important for like class consciousness and for, you know, furthering class war. Um, it does incredible work at undermining ideology um, because it makes clear to people that what is being done in this society is so unnatural to control people, to limit their ability to use the bathroom, um, you know, to, to re reduce their ability to communicate with one another, to prevent them from being able to join together in a bargaining unit to make sure that they're getting fair wages and fair treatment. Um, to to do to control somebody on that level is disgusting but then let's also not forget the mechanism um, by which they control people they control people because they control access those people working people's access um to their ability to acquire food health care shelter shelter and life that's extremely unnatural and you can understand that. And people do understand that. That's why, you know, like being against the excessive wealth of the billionaires, being against even big corporations is not even something that is uniquely left wing, right? And it's really important to build on that human consciousness, that human understanding that that's an immoral system and there's something really wrong with it, right? Um, but it, it's, and, and, and it also should be noted that it creates, it makes people do bad things, right? It creates monsters like Jeff Bezos. Um, but I think it's also important that we not fall into the trap ever of, of thinking that, you know, these people do these wicked things solely because Jeff Bezos has, you know, an impure soul. He certainly has a lot of issues, but he has issues that were developed because he decided that he wanted to make as much money as possible because he yeah. lives in a society and in a system that tells people that that's a good thing. And that is a cause that you are able to subvert all other human uh, emotions for. Yeah, you try building Amazon and maintaining purity of soul. No, you like you literally will not be able. Cannot to do, it, do it. Right. That's why it's so funny. Like Google having the "Don't be evil" catchphrase back in the day. <laughs> yeah. Like just transparently. Like I mean, I feel like at a certain point, like we already realized this as a society, and Google's just like shit, guys. Right, we're gonna be the new company. Mm -hmm. that, and yeah, <laughs> and and. No, no, exactly. And like, I mean, and they spend so much money on PR. And that's one thing, too, you have to understand about what Jeff Bezos is doing. He's a savvy guy. He gets that his one. These guys get that the writing is on the wall um, and that people are fed up with the concentration of wealth and power that yeah. they have. But again, to fuck off to Mars. We all. Well, yeah. And like, exactly. Like, we all know um, that he's not disappearing from the company or from his stolen wealth. Right. But let's just pretend that he actually was just cashing out and walking away from everything. He's not giving away his money. That's because he doesn't respect people and he doesn't respect democracy. Think about what Matt was just referencing. His disgusting answer about what he should do with his wealth, right? Where he says, well, the only logical thing I could do with my winnings is to go to space, right? Which is absolutely disgusting and an unhinged answer. Psycho. Um, but and we can make points it's like, oh, well, actually, you should do it. You should use it to, you know, help people. You should use it to fight homelessness and all these kind of things. Why would he do that? The, he understands this system. He understands that doing something like that in like the earnest sense would mean threatening the system that allows him to have this much power. This is a guy who leveraged people's fear of being homeless their entire life, right, to extract as much as possible from them. Right. Why would he try to alleviate the system that has put him on top? Because 
you know, he understands that doing something like that is actually a direct threat to him. Um, and it also has to be noted that just like Bill Gates and Zuckerberg and all these other billionaires, we've talked about it. We talked about this a lot on TMBS. And I'm sure we'll do more about it on, on this show as well. How the, you know, about the philanthropy scam. Um, it's not only a scam because they're trying to wash their image in people's <laughs> public imagination. Um, but it's also the most blatant power grab that that you could ever do because this is somebody saying i'm not going to let uh, society uh, tax me and use this money in ways that they think is just i think that i'm smarter than society and i'm going to use it in ways that i want to which just so happen to personally benefit me and my friends and and all of these other folks right just like we talked about a couple of weeks ago bill gates uh you know and his just disastrous foray uh, into agriculture now in the united states but years and years of it in africa right these yeah. guys are anti-democratic figures. Their existence is an affront to democracy. It's it's even, I mean, Gil Scott Heron has the great poem, Whitey on the Moon, that talks about, you know, in the midst of all the, um, you know, uh, economic inequality of the 60s, 70s, um, we're, you know, going to space. Mm -hmm. And it's even more egregious that a private individual is who is like making money off of a lot of, you know, postal carriers and stuff like that. Like every, like all of those, that's the hard work. Like there's a funny joke about like, um, uh, diamond, uh, and like how much bank labor he must've done to earn uh, how many billions of dollars that he has. Right. Like, of course, this is all everybody else's work that he just gets to be in charge of now mm -hmm. and decide like, I'm going to go to space and try to be space King for a future space civilization. Like, <laughs> That's literally what the guy is saying to you right now. Mm -hmm. And people are like, oh, man, we love the innovator. It, it, I mean, like Matt Damon, I didn't watch it, but that Elysium movie where like rich people <laughs> shaped to like a satellite, like we know, all know what this is. And, and it's funny, I mean, to see that like go through the business press, like it's interesting that he would decide oh, yeah. to do that. What a, what a fun project. Like he's fucking painting like W. Bush after retirement. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like that kind of drooling coverage is just another example of of what happens with just years and years of, of privatization of the media right uh where people just because local newsrooms across the country are just so devoid of of funding you just take press releases uh, from from jeff bezos or from amazon all these corporations that essentially just do it again i wanted to put this clip of bernie sanders up um because i actually think it highlights one of the big projects of this show and the kind of political education that we're, we want to try to build because that kind of analysis of Jeff Bezos um, that, you know, we can start from the moral place, but you need to get to the point where you can say he would like anyone in that position would do the same kind of wickedness because that system creates it. Right. We can again, we can be mad and should be mad and should call out people by name and you know hold them responsible for what they did. Uh, but we also need to understand that there's no level of soulfulness or like meditation or like heart, you know, nice walk through the woods that Jeff Bezos or any of these people are going to do that is going to stop them being what they are, right? Because they exist in a system that tells them they need to maximize profits. And maximizing profits for corporations will always be at the expense of working people. And Bernie Sanders does a great job here at, at talking about how he found all of these ideas uh, connected. This is a phenomenal clip. Uh, ever since I was a little kid, I really did not like to see bullies. I didn't like to see you know stronger kids picking on weaker kids. I didn't like you know, discrimination, and I didn't like that. I didn't like power plays on the part of people who had the power. Uh, but that was just kind of instinctual. And, you know, as a kid, I felt strongly about racism uh, and poverty. And when I went to the University of Chicago, I was not a good student, but what I did do is spend an enormous amount of time down in the, what they call the stacks of the library. It was a very good library. And I would bury myself in there, uh, reading everything that I could read about history and politics and sociology and economics and psychology. I did a whole lot of reading. I was a terrible, not a terrible, was well, not a good student, let's say that. <laughs> uh, but I did a whole lot of reading. But what the Young People's Socialist League did to me, it helped me put two and two together in my mind. In other words, we don't like poverty. We don't like racism. We don't like war. We don't like exploitation. What do they all have in common? And people say, well, you know, I'm, I'm against poverty, but why 
for example, at a time when we are the wealthiest country in the history of the world, why do we have 43 million people living in poverty? Why do we have such an unfair distribution of wealth and income? What does wealth and power mean? How does it influence politics? Money always played a dominant role, a very important role in who gets elected. Now, as a result of Citizens United, it is far worse. Who decided that World War I would take place? Who even knows why we went to war in World War I? What was that about? Who makes these decisions? So what my studies tried to do is put two and two and two together. And uh, that is why you know, I kind of evolved to an analysis which tries to tell, explain to me why what goes on in, in the world uh, today and then. Oh, you're Sorry. muted. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he's the, he was the real deal. And I think, you know, we can be more explicit about, about some of that analysis, but uh, that's exactly why uh, political education is important. And it's something that I harp on a lot and I hope I'm not boring people with it, but it, it, it's, it's, it is something that is, is really critical to have as part of our movement because I see people say things like, oh, if you're, if you're working class, you already understand. It's like you, you understand that there's something afoot, right? You understand that there's something wrong and you probably even have like a real desire to, to push back against the system. But what you need is that next step um, to understand what that system is and how it operates. And then most importantly, how to do something about it. And that's one of the most vexing and important questions uh, that the left has to deal with. And we're not going to be able to dance our way around it. We won't be able to theorize our way around it. Um, but if we don't start building that kind of understanding and building movements that are thinking together and participating in politics together, we'll never get out of it. Yeah, to me, it's like the most convincing answer to like existential questions like, why am I here, for instance, <laughs> right? Like, like if I, like for me, thinking about that question and when it's posed in like the 2000s or 90s it's like i'm here to uh change the world and you know i'm going to join like a corporate law firm or something to do that right like like that sort mm -hmm. of generic like why am i here but like to you can actually answer these questions of like why you're here according to like the capitalist system like mm -hmm. why why uh, are you allowed into certain countries with from certain areas um for uh, also like um right like all these mm -hmm. questions have answers within these structures and uh it's actually like a, a, a big moment in someone's life when you start to drill in on just the reality of it because it tethers you to the world we live in um and i i mean i think only um these sorts of politics really approaches that and i think other politics are mainly to obscure these sorts of um this this sort of education Exactly. And it's like, you know, that's why the self-help industry is like, what, a six, seven billion right. dollar industry. Um, and we're actually going to go through some of that like uh, oh, yes. grind stuff with the post game. Folks, um, we got an upscale luxury post game coming, uh, for patron members. So you're going to want to get on patreon.com slash left reckoning if you want that upscale luxury. Yeah, post get, that, get that mindset. Um, this should be it should be a lot of fun. Um, bef but before we get to that, I wanted to do uh, one more one more segment. Uh, because there has been some some you know some good news you know we've talked a lot on this show and also on TMBS beforehand about what has been going on uh, in Austin Texas first with the defund the police movement but then also with trying to reallocate some of those funds reallocate that money to helping out the people um, who desperately need it um, we're talking here about you know homeless folk right and being able to not only prevent them from being harassed and abused by the police force, but also giving people pathways into some level of, of stability, right? And I want to share this, this story in sort of, you know, hope that we can continue to build on this um, and, and celebrate a great moment. And also just as an antidote to all of like the struggle porn that's out there. Right, um, where we actually see a story where somebody who was struggling um, is able to, you know, get out of that situation, was able to get out of that situation because of collective action and politics. Um, and to really, you know, drive home, this is what can happen um, when we organize and, and build deliberate politics that they really can change people's lives and it's really important. Um, so if Matt, you have this uh, this up here, we can share. Do yeah, um, I want to play this clip here? Oh, sure, I guess so. I'd... It's up to you. I mean, we can just share the... Um... I think sharing the article might be better. Um, 
so the article is is uh, from KXAN, which is local news in Austin. And the headline is I won Austinite exiting homelessness after eight months stay at city owned hospital. If you go down a little bit, um, eight months ago, uh, Jason was on his deathbed. A cycle of hospitalization had worn down the 46 year old who had been living beneath U.S. Route 183 in North Austin. I've done a lot of damage, um, you know, and I'm trying to recover. And this is what's important. As part of his recovery, a fleshman was brought to the um, to the former Country Inn and Suites, originally purchased by the city of Austin for permanent supportive housing. The building has been used as a protective lodge to house high risk individuals experiencing homelessness during the pandemic. Um, and if you go down the you know the story a little bit, and you should, I'll, I'll tweet out a link. Um, you know, basically this this gentleman, along with you know other people, were able to be brought into this facility. Uh, which then gave them the kind of connections uh, that were necessary uh, to get acquire employment. And then eventually, and how this story ends is he was able to acquire his own housing. He is able to sign a lease on his own apartment, right? Um, that's what happens when you take a proactive uh, you know, solution to homelessness. And as this, this uh, points out, the argument here, uh, I think, I, I personally, I'm, I'm much more of a fan of like the moral argument here, but the fact is mm -hmm. that the numbers also back up this position too. the public cost of keeping people homeless. And I think that's the way you should say it to keep people homeless, right? Cause it's making sure that people understand that that's a deliberate decision by our political system and by our economic system to keep people homeless, um, to keep people homeless. It costs $101,000. That's the public cost. Um, to provide people with housing and provide people with job assistance and all these other programs, it's going to cost a lot less um, than, than just keeping somebody homeless, and it's much more humane. Um, I think that's good for the for the article there. Um, so this is like a, a really has been a really incredible story, and I also wanted to highlight too as we were you know setting up today, um, Austin is now going to buy a second hotel uh, that will become permanent supportive housing, uh, which that city desperately needs, uh, but also cities across the country desperately need. And this has been a long time fight, not just in Austin, uh, but, but across the country for people who are advocating for folks who are for are homeless uh, to make sure that we just get people in houses. The thing is like the solution to this problem is honestly, it's so much more simple than people make it out to be. Just give people access to shelter and a lot of those other issues that people deal with start to wither away. And, you know, provide them obviously with all the other support that they need. But if the, if the problem is homelessness, house people. Um, and that's just an incredible example of what can happen, not just with these kind of programs, but in this situation, taking money from the police budget and using it to support those kind of programs. That's a much better society um, and a better world to, to live in. Yeah. And like on the, um, on the efficiency argument, it's like, one th like those come up a lot, right? It's like, why are we doing this inefficient thing when the efficient thing that is also the moral thing is, and it's because there are people invested in, for instance, like keeping housing as a financial uh, speculation uh, uh, asset or, and also like we want to make sure like people like shelter precarity is good for uh, the capitalists who want labor uh, wages suppressed, for instance, right? <laughs> Um, like people have to put up with a lot more shit if they need a house to live in. Whereas if that is something that they, they can be provided, all of a sudden, like maybe they have to go to a shitty boss that's going to exploit them. Yeah, and 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 it's a goal um, position too, um, because to do that, you have to implement wide scale violence against people who have been pushed out of homes or don't have access to homes because the price has skyrocketed. Yeah, so as Matt was saying. To benefit those people's financial interests, just endless increase in property value. Uh, and you have to rely on violence by the state to maintain that system. That's a big part, by the way, of what that hundred one thousand um, dollars is when they're talking about the cost to society. Yeah, and so to counter that, like you need to be able to recite these examples of actually the government dealing with this problem in a real way, because it was terrifying. Like last year. Uh, when the right thought it was going to be a campaign issue that, hey, let's get, let's send DHS or whoever to go round up homeless people in mm -hmm. like LA, right? Like they were really testing that as like a campaign message. Mm -hmm. um, so like, yeah, these sites, like the fact that this is a, uh, a problem one that is being maintained and we can end it uh, within our power and not through these horrible, horrible measures that are suggested. Exactly. And I have to, I, so I wanted to start with, with the good, 
right? Um, because there's a bit of a call here. Um, I will, we will do something with uh, Seneca Savoy uh, soon on this, who is an incredible organizer in, in Austin, Texas. Um, but there is a campaign in Austin called Save Austin Now, uh, which is essentially just a front group for these interests that Matt was just describing, uh, folks who would rather see human beings suffer to protect their bottom line. Um, and again, I also don't want to make it ever seem like, uh, you know, to make sure that other people uh, prosper in a general sense, normal people prosper, uh, you know, uh, that you have to choose between basically having some stability in, in most people's major investment, which is their home. Um, and, you know, and, and this, that, you know, that's not the case. It's just these people who are at the very top want to make sure uh, that that system is not threatened at all. Um, anyway, Save Austin now has basically been from my understanding, too, for people who I've been talking to in Austin, um, have been basically misrepresenting themselves to folks. Uh, the name, obviously, is one of those kind of sinister names. You have no idea what they're standing for. They'll stand outside of the HEB, the you know grocery store, um, and say, like, do you want to help out the homeless? <laughs> um, and, you know, get people to sign petitions, right? They're taking advantage of folks. It's absolutely disgusting. Um, but they have a, uh, um, I believe it's going to be on the ballot in May. Um, they got enough petitions to basically hold a referendum on the the uh, so basically Austin also uh, got made it so the police can't abuse people who are camping, people who are you know set up tents to you know you know semi permanent uh, structures. <clears throat> they made it so that the police could not you know round those people up. Right, um, the Save Austin Now group actually wants to reinstate uh, the camping ban. Um, and they were able to get enough uh, signatures to still put that on the ballot, which means that this fight that you know might have felt that it was settled six, nine months ago um, is now coming up again, which is another great example of why we have to build those kind of movements and campaigns that are so deeply rooted that they're prepared uh, so we don't have to rebuild coalitions right. and every time this comes up. Uh, but definitely for people in that area, that's something to, to be watching. We'll try to build something around it and make sure um, you know, that folks are, are prepared to push back against that. I know stuff is being worked on as we speak to direct people too. So I'll be sure to do it as soon as possible. Very interesting stuff. Um, anything else we want to get to before? No, we, uh... I think, I think, you know, for everybody, this has been a really fun show. It, um, I always appreciate everyone. We, we appreciate all of our listeners, but especially the patrons. And if you want to become a patron, join us over at patreon.com slash uh, left reckoning. Uh, we're going to get to some fun stuff. Uh, we're going to get to this upscale luxury, um, you know, hustle and grind we're, culture. We're going we're gonna to fix a lot of your mindsets because a lot <laughs> of you don't have. You, you guys got, you, you guys got loser mindsets. Y'all yeah, got to really get up in the morning, understand uh, that, you know, to, to make the millions, to make all the money. You yeah. really need to start setting positive goals for yourself instead of yeah. being so negative all the time. I, I look in the Twitch chat and the YouTube chat. I'm not seeing a lot of success, uh, you know, yeah. oriented mindsets. <laughs> um, and really, that's the first step, guys. So we're going to fix is. that. Although that's, of course, you know, we have to charge for that. So <laughs> Yeah, we have to charge for that. Um, that's um, how we know you're successful. Exactly. I mean, that's the first step to success is giving us some money. Um, <laughs> um, uh, so patreon.com slash left reckoning. We also are going to get into Lauren Boebert um, and her pork sliders uh, that caused a, like a minor health, uh, you know, uh, I mean, not a pandemic, I guess it's too wide, but um, uh, I mean, it caused a severe problem at local hospitals. Oh, let's just put it that way. So if you want to, um, and during a pandemic, this happened. So um, not the time to be taxing local hospital structure. But uh, uh, yeah, uh, and we'll be doing a few other things too. Maybe get into Crowder. And uh, we have some also uh, uh, real stories, I guess, too, maybe. And your uh, IMs. Um, yeah, we'll take some questions as well. So definitely join us for that. And, uh, you know, hope to see everybody soon. All right, folks, we will see you later.